uh, to find out and help uh, people and everyone with PS PTSD. Um, I was just speaking with her before um, some of you all arrived, and we were talking about our strong relationship that our students used to have with the Veterans Affairs. And she's, inst she's interested in starting that relationship again. That's how passionate she is about people and about her mission in life. And without further delay, we will welcome Dr. Schur. Uh, good morning. I want to thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. Uh, it, it meant a lot. I have to say it also made me think that we have some old content on the internet because uh, I, that, that I am now a full professor and you know it takes a while to do that. So somewhere lurking are uh, stories about me that are only partially true. Uh, I, I was telling uh, the dean that um, I used to come to uh, South Royalton all the time, usually riding my bike. And I would just ride by the law school. I never had a chance to actually visit. More recently, I only come here to eat french fries at Worthy. Uh, <laughs> that tells you what happens as you get older. Uh, but, uh, but seriously, I'm very glad to be here. And I thought that what I would do today in this talk is rather than talk about prisoners or lawyers or things that might be very specific, I would go broad. Because this topic is broad and it's something, PTSD is something that is relevant to, to all citizens of the world. And so I want to talk in that way. I have a little content that will focus on legal issues, but in the conversation, I'm prepared to talk more specifically in the conversation about things you might need to know for your profession. I also usually talk about veterans and I'm not going to talk about veterans today. That is my passion and I'm glad to answer questions about that. So I think I realize there's a logistic challenge. I'm gonna to try to, if this will come out because I can't see the slides and talk into the microphone but now I can. So, is this going to change the slides? Don't you love it? This happens everywhere all around the world. Okay, so I'm gonna do it on the computer. Did I have to? Larger and in your hand and then we press the arrow. Oh, it was upside down. Yes. Okay, there we go, thank you. So uh, just a bit about where I am. I, I work just down the road in White River Junction at the National Center for PTSD. We are a congressionally mandated center of excellence uh, that's been around since 1984. The legislation uh, gave, uh, uh, directed VA to create us in uh, 19, we've been around since 89 and the, and the legislation was in uh, 84. Our mission is to promote the best clinical care and functional status of veterans through research, education, and training related to etiology, diagnosis, and treatment of PTSD and stress-related disorders. We are not a clinical program, but we support clinical programs. We also have a, a brain bank as one of our uh, initiatives uh, because that is really a new frontier. We're very excited. We are the first and only in the world brain bank uh, dedicated to PTSD. We're a, a virtual center, uh, which is a very common thing these days in 1989 when we opened. Uh, we had to do a lot of convincing of people that we could function this way. This uh, graph just depicts the, um, the geographic dispersion. Most of our divisions are in the East Coast, focused on uh, topics that are uh, specialty, so neurosciences and evaluation in West Haven, behavioral sciences and women's health in Boston, dissemination and training in Palo Alto, and then our Pacific Islands Division uh, in Honolulu focuses on ethnocultural diversity issues. We are the executive division in White River Junction. 
essentially the way to think about us, and we're actually a resource for you and, and everyone in the, the country, we're an information business. And so what we try to do is generate, collate, synthesize, disseminate, and promote the implementation of the best information about PTSD. That's what I'm trying to do today. I wanna to put in your hands the best information that you can go to the bank on and use in your private life and in uh, your work. So PTSD is in the news all the time. Uh, this morning I decided I would see what the New York Times had this week, and I, I discovered something I had missed yesterday. They've been commemorating the 50th anniversary of the book Slaughterhouse-Five. Have any of you read that book? Okay, this is Kurt Vonnegut's way of trying to make sense out of his experience as a prisoner of war. I'm gonna go back and reread it, but it's a wonderful book anyway, even if you don't look at it through a PTSD lens. If you've read it after today, go back and read the book, because I'm hoping you'll have different uh, insights. Now, so PTSD is news, but it's, it's absolutely not new. Not only in Slaughterhouse-Five, but in the historical literature, of going back to the ancient Greeks and Shakespeare, you can find references. In the medical literature, probably the, the agreed upon earliest documentation are the symptoms that were described after the Great London Fire in 1662. After that, we saw it in the medical literature under various names that were specific either to an event type or an era, Soldier's Heart, which was, world, which was the Civil War, Railway Spine, which probably did help a lot of person, uh, personal injury lawyers because uh, the train travel was not that safe in the late 1800s and the symptoms were described of what we would call PTSD now were described as railway spine, shell shock World War I, rape trauma syndrome, uh, post-Vietnam syndrome. There was a problem with all of this because all of these things were looked at as separate disorders separate conditions, and what was the, the really important point for our understanding of how traumatic events change people was the formalization of the PTSD diagnostic criteria in 1980. The American Psychiatric Association wrote it into its third edition of the diagnostic manual. Now this slide, and I hope I can find the, is there a, a laser pointer on this? Okay, it does require eye-hand coordination. So, so what happened in, in 1980 is that people, who, especially people who were studying Holocaust survivors, rape survivors, and Vietnam veterans, realized they had more in common than they had been thinking. And that this underlying condition was something that deserved broader attention. And so those, there were other people at the table, but those were primary influences on shaping the diagnosis. And what you're seeing here on this slide, uh, depicting the number of publications on trauma, the, the uh, vertical line, which is in red, depicts the uh, DSM-5, 1980, and you can see the top, gra the top line is the number of publications per year just on trauma, the bottom on uh, treating trauma. So we saw an explosion. We have a database that we collate in, um, at our center in White River, and we've got now over 60,000 articles in the literature uh, on the topic. So interest in PTSD since then has come and gone, but 9-11 has had a fundamental, had a fundamental impact, uh, increasing the scientific uh, interest and the public awareness. And it, one study looked at publications on disaster in the professional literature and found, compared the five years before 9-11 with the five years after 9-11, and found there was a 145% increase in the number of articles on trauma or PTSD. In specialty journals, it was even larger in general medical journals. And the New England Journal of Medicine, I don't even know what this looks like, had a 2,340% increase in the number of articles on trauma and PTSD, which essentially says they, didn't, they published one maybe ever in their history. This, after 9-11, we had a, a number of events that kept this in the public eye. This is a good thing because 
we no longer have to re-educate people every time a new event happens. We had the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had Hurricane Katrina. We were, we were just one after the other for a few years. The Southeast Asian tsunami, the bombings in London and Madrid. We had earthquakes in uh, Haiti and Japan. And mass casualty shootings, unfortunately, have been uh, you know, the f a foundation through all of this, most recently in New Zealand. So I want to make a point here that uh, because I speak to the media a lot and somehow Rambo is still the face of PTSD for many people, an angry veteran with a gun. And in fact, anytime there's a shooter, I, we, we say to ourselves, we hope it's not a veteran because people are going to assume it's a veteran with a mental health disorder and that that disorder is PTSD. This is not the face of PTSD. These are, this happens to be from a, a video gallery that we have of veterans uh, who speak about their PTSD and getting treatment. But essentially PTSD is, is all of us. And the odds are, when I show you some data, you'll see that, I mean, some of you, I may be talking to people in, who have PTSD or who have had it. You may know people who have had, and the odds are that at least half of you have had the kind of event that can cause PTSD. So here's some important facts that I'm gonna to try to cover. A traumatic stressor is not just a really bad stressor. It's, it's not um, breaking up with someone or, or losing your job, even those, though those things are hard. Exposure to traumatic events is common, and also common, most people have symptoms after an event. We don't just get out of a car after a car crash and say, oh, I, I think I'll go to Worthy for a burger. Uh, we, we have symptoms, and that's a very normal thing, yet most people don't develop PTSD. I'll talk about why we think that is. At the same time, PTSD is not a sign of weakness because there are many factors that contribute to this, and also it's not a life sentence. When I came into the field, we pretty much thought we taught people how to cope with PTSD. We don't cure it in enough people yet, but we're, we do cure it in some people and the treatments get better all the time. So uh, this is a picture of uh, an unnamed student here uh, who's studying for exam. No, this is actually <laughs> free internet content, uh, so I didn't violate any uh, copyright permissions. But stressors are a fact of life. For students, it's often exams and where you're going to get a job or, or go next. We're designed, humans and animals are designed biologically, psychologically, we have evolved to deal with stress. We have a lot of good systems that help us recover. But at a point, stressors can exhaust an individual's ability to cope and then result in severe and prolonged distress, psychological disorder, and medical illness. Now, traumatic stressors, I said that, that not everything is a, 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 a traumatic stressor. These are defined by injury or a life threat. So things like physical and sexual assault, combat, serious accidents, disasters, torture, and they can be experienced directly, they can be witnessed, or in some cases uh, learned about, such as when you learn about the a traumatic death of a loved one. Now, this is scientifically plausible. This is an article about cows who witness wolf attacks suffering symptoms similar to PTSD. This is, the, you, you can traumatize an animal. Usually we study rats and we traumatize them with things like cats, which can actually produce the same kind of reactions that we have uh, to fearful uh, stimuli. Uh, one thing that this article noted, I don't know, can you read the article from here? But it noted that uh, cows who have witnessed this may have fertility problems. And it's actually the case that with severe and prolonged stress, you may see uh, medical effects. That's one of the things that I study, and we do see problems with pregnancy and birth associated with PTSD. So that's plausible, but this is not. Somebody claiming in Hollywood, of course, that um, uh, he w w this man was convinced a film crew filming a movie next to him caused PTSD. So we shouldn't trivialize PTSD. We should also respect the fact that non-traumatic events may be more stressful to individuals, but, but traumatic events cause a specific kind of reaction that can lead to PTSD. Uh, they, traumatic stressors come in a variety of, there are many dimensions to traumatic stressors. Uh, 
For example, consider stranger rape in adulthood with uh, seductive child abuse. These are both sexual assault, but they're very, very different experiences. Th think about occupational exposures. M most of us don't have occupational exposure, uh, but think about military veterans and first responders. Uh, the, the cumulative effects of repeated traumas, think about a firefighter pull, you know, pulling people out of uh, buildings, uh, or so many people actually who serve in these professions will talk about specific incidents. I had pulled kids out of buildings a hundred times, but it was that one kid that did it for me. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, stressors can be directly experienced or witnessed or learned about. So trauma exposure is very common. These are old data, but I'm presenting them because I think they're still uh, valid. Uh, these are from a large national survey, and, and what they, they show is uh, this study found that 60% of men and 50% of women have had at least one event, and if you have one, you're likely to have more than one. Uh, the numbers may be around 60% overall, uh, and, and um, what, what you can also see is that the types of events vary between themselves and also between men and women. So women are more likely than men to experience uh, sexual traumas, uh, child abuse and neglect. Men are more likely to experience combat, but in the new wars, I would say that we are seeing women now who have bona fide substantial combat experience. And then men are more likely to experience things like witnessing accidents, uh, threats with a weapon, and, and so on. Now, I, I mentioned this, most people have symptoms, it's, it's normal to have symptoms after a traumatic event. Uh, for example, re-experiencing the event through um, nightmares or upsetting memories that, that come back to you. Avoiding reminders of the event is very, very common. Feeling numb, just shut down. A lot of military veterans will say this, that you know, my training kicked in, I'm, I'm just numb. And, or feeling guilty or ashamed in some way, and also feeling very keyed up and uh, easily startled. So most people will have these, but the symptoms decrease in the days and the weeks following. So we don't call those symptoms PTSD. We could refer to them as PTSD symptoms, but we don't say that a person has PTSD, even if they have a lot of these symptoms uh, in the week or so after an event. Usually, by about a month, most of the symptoms have gone away or they're at a manageable level. And so what's happening with PTSD is, is somehow the normal recovery process is interrupted. So it's normal to react to a stressor, it's normal to cope with a stressor, and something or things are happening to prevent us from healing ourselves the way we uh, normally do, recovering the way we normally do. And so we only define PTSD when the symptoms persist at a severe level and show a characteristic pattern. These are the official diagnostic criteria from DSM-5. That means Diagnostic Statistical Manual. We're now up to the fifth edition, which was uh, issued in 2013. So first of all, you have to have exposure to an event, and we define that as wit experiencing, witnessing, or being confronted by death or serious injury to self or others. There are four clusters of symptoms, 20 overall re-experiencing the trauma through memories, flashbacks, nightmares, avoiding reminders of the trauma, negative changes in cognitions and mood, such as the, the numbing and the, the guilt and shame that I mentioned, and then hyperarousal and reactivity. The symptoms have to last a month and cause clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning. So common patterns of reactions to traumatic stress uh, can be classified roughly in the, the following way. So thinking about before, oh, let me say this is an arbitrary scale from zero to 100. That's just no symptoms to the maximal amount of symptoms, or a lot of symptoms. And so if you think, look at the blue line here, before the trauma, assuming people have, they have no symptoms of PTSD. And then there's a rise in the one to two weeks afterwards. But by about one month, people may have some, but things are improving. And this is the vast majority of people. And by a year, uh, maybe it shouldn't go to zero because we're changed by traumatic events. I've had three, and I can tell you I'm changed by those events. So maybe they're not really uh, zero, but basically you get the picture. We're upset 
we have symptoms, we're distressed, and, and we generally recover. Now, some smaller percentage of people will start out their immediate reaction is higher, and I'll say this, people who go on to have PTSD usually have a more pronounced reaction immediately and in the one to two week phase. And then uh, some people, you know, at a month, people have PTSD. Some people do recover or they partially recover, and some people go on to a chronic course. So this is typical. Sometimes there's a delayed onset. Usually people don't have zero symptoms and then develop symptoms, but there could be delayed onset. Some people just show nothing. They're really shut down. You might say that's also a symptom. But that's generally what happens. So I, I've been saying most people don't develop PTSD. Here are some of the numbers for the US population. Uh, when we talk about lifetime PTSD, that includes both past and present. And so about, oops, sorry. 6% uh, of US adults will have PTSD at some point in their lives, and about 4.7% have it at any current point in time. Now you can see here there's a gender difference, and it's true here and very much around the world that generally women are more likely than men to develop PTSD. And I'll tell you right out, some of it is due to the type of traumas women are likely to experience. Some of it may be due to biology, but we don't know that. Some of it may be due to psychology or sociology. But that's how it is. So if we looked, if I were, this is the entire population. If I showed you among people who are traumatized, it's roughly 8% of men and 20% of women. And this is across all types of traumas. These are national estimates. PTSD prevalence is higher in countries that have um, war or, uh, or uh, violence. And this is an old slide, but I wanted to show it to you because it was in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a very good study. And what you're seeing here is a lifetime prevalence of PTSD as high as 37% in Algeria. Contrast that with our lifetime prevalence of uh, around 6%. Uh, the, uh, the numbers here probably would be, the numbers would be off the chart, for example, if we looked at Syria or Yemen right now. I wanted to show this slide also to say that PTSD is not a Western construction, that we can see it around the world. We see it in low and middle income countries. One of my favorite uh, articles is one about PTSD in the Kalahari Bushmen. Uh, where, where people went and were able to find symptoms related to PTSD. Turns out they engage in a lot of domestic violence. Who knew, right? But they do, and so there's a fairly high prevalence of PTSD. But the symptoms make sense to them, and, and when they talk about their experiences, it sounds like PTSD. So even though there may be cultural expressions of uh, distress and, and uh, disorder, the, the PTSD is universal, I'm convinced of that. So um, I thought maybe you certainly probably know this already, but PTSD prevalence is higher in incarcerated populations. They have a lot of exposure to trauma. And these are data from a recent meta-analysis that I found looking at the prevalence of PTSD in men and women who are incarcerated, and this is from around the world. Now it's mostly Western countries, but it's still uh, international. And the uh, lifetime prevalence in men, almost one in five men have uh, PTSD and almost two in five women. That prevalence really concerns me, but it doesn't surprise me. I see heads nodding in the audience as, as well. So this is important to understand. I think I wanna echo this, that in dealing with many people who have distress, symptoms, dysfunction, PTSD may be underlying or, or a part of that whole picture, and it's often not uh, asked about, it's often not understood. Now, PTSD fa varies as a function of the type of trauma and gender. We already saw that in the overall estimate. So women are more likely than men to develop PTSD. This slide also is fairly uh, complicated, so let me try to unpack it. Uh, this depicts the prevalence of PTSD in men and women 
and the women are always on the, the right. I think the uh, computer's playing a little funny with the, uh, the shading right now. But the, the um, men on the left, women on the right, this is the conditional probability of developing PTSD, meaning if you had physical attack, how likely were you to develop PTSD? And what I've tried to do is note, first of all, you can see that the prevalence depends on the type of trauma. So rape, rape is the most likely traumatic event to lead to PTSD. Combat is the next most likely, and certain types of combat exposure can be certainly, you know, as, as likely as, as rape in terms of uh, the, the kind of uh, dimensions that some people see in combat. I see Harrison nodding his head. He's a veteran, so he knows from experience here. But what, what's important here is, again, the, the message is not all stressors are equally likely to lead to PTSD. And uh, also that men and women differ in their reactions. So for example, physical attack. Women are much more likely than men to develop PTSD due to a physical attack. Threat with a weapon, similarly. Uh, sexual assault, even so, women are more likely. Uh, the data on rape here make it look as if men are more likely than women to develop PTSD uh, due to a rape, very small numbers for the men. And so it's not, uh, it's not pr a precise estimate. Now, uh, this slide is unintelligible and uh, intentionally so. I just wanted to show you uh, some, some recent data looking at this question of whether legal professionals can be traumatized by exposure to their clients' uh, traumatic events. So, some, some evidence suggests this may be the case, and so this study uh, for those of you who know statistics, it's, they're trying to do a cross-leg panel analysis here. But essentially what they're trying to do is look at how um, PTSD at, at baseline, if you will, and um, exposure to um, uh, clients' traumas predict subsequent uh, PTSD. And essentially, they looked at 107 public defenders, and what they found is, is in fact, there was a prediction. So even when you take baseline levels into, when you take all these factors into account, that um, the amount of exposure to a client's trauma predicted future PTSD symptoms in legal professionals. I don't know if this rings true for any of you, uh, but, but, but I wanted to tell you this because it's something that's probably under-recognized. Now, this study to me doesn't prove PTSD because they use the measure that's actually more a measure of distress rather than PTSD specifically. So what, this, what I take away from this is that there may be bona fide effects of, of exposure to client trauma on your own mental health and well-being. And that might, in fact, be one of the key issues uh, that you want to discuss uh, today. So I already mentioned that many factors uh, influence the likelihood that you will develop PTSD, uh, the traumatic event and gender or two that we covered, but also other personal factors as well as the recovery environment. Let me unpack that a little bit. So the characteristics of the exposure, the, the type, the duration, the intensity, how much, whether there were atrocities involved and such all make a, a difference. Personal factors that include an individual's history, if they've had prior trauma exposure, uh, other prior adversity. Um, how many of you have heard of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences? So, so we've recognized that a lot of things that are not just the kind of stressors that cause PTSD can set people up on a downward spiral in life. And those are the kind of things uh, that could make you more like, uh, make a person more likely to develop PTSD. Uh, history of psychiatric disorder uh, also. Uh, we mentioned female gender, but being younger generally at the time of a trauma makes it harder because it makes it harder to process the event. Um, minority race, although some of that is explained by um, the types of uh, trauma exposure, and it seems to be more so a uh, related to Hispanic ethnicity rather than uh, race. 
and then lower education, which I think also is uh, consistent with the younger age as a risk factor. Uh, there are genetic factors too, but there's no PTSD gene. Please remember that because there are multiple there are multiple genes that determine our susceptibility to uh, a psychiatric disorder. But I do want to mention that there are genetic factors that might make a person more likely or more resilient in the face of a, a trauma. And lastly, the characteristics of the recovery environment are really important. So even people who are set up with a lot of risk factors will not necessarily develop PTSD in a recovery environment that supports them and that is free from stress and, and further trauma. So you can imagine in a war zone, however, how hard this is because not, let's say a woman is, is raped and then is dealing with living in a refugee camp where there's continued stressors, there's food, there may be food insecurity uh, and, and, and a great deal of loss because uh, you know, many family members are, are lost and so on. So you could see how people could spiral down in that kind of environment. So we don't know exactly why people develop PTSD, and there's no single answer, but we have clues about what's, what's happening, and they're both biological and psychological. One of the key things, for whatever reason, that people choose to avoid, avoiding the uh, event uh, or incompletely processing the event because it's too painful, uh, is really key. And in fact, some of our most effective treatments go after that uh, avoidance. So somehow we have to assimilate the experience of the event, who we were before, what we knew about the world, and how it's changed since we found out that the world is different than we thought, how we accommodate that and bring that into ourselves and, and our sense of the world to, to make sense of it and to trust the world and ourselves. Maladaptive beliefs along these lines are also key and the avoidance and maladaptive beliefs go hand in hand. And some of our most effective treatments also help people examine their beliefs, such as, I can't trust anybody anymore. You know, the, wor the world is just too uh, scary. Uh, help people take a look at those beliefs because they, they're probably not true, but at least to examine them in light of uh, a broader sample of evidence. And then the stress system is dysregulated in PTSD. So you are really flooded in the moment, and in some cases, th this, uh, this persists. And you're, you're really keyed up the noradrenergic system, which is part of the stress system, is in, on high alert. And uh, there, there's a disruption of normal rhythms because you are so keyed up. And this, this may contribute, we th well, we think it does contribute to the likelihood. So it's biological and it's psychological and it's multiply determined. And this is why PTSD is not a sign of weakness because there are so many factors that determine whether a person will develop PTSD. Now, PTSD is important because it often leads to other problems. There's an increased risk of numerous psychiatric disorders, most often depression, other anxiety disorders, and substance use. Uh, the table on the right here um, shows some national data on the likelihood of having uh, a mood disorder that is associated with PTSD, anxiety disorder, or substance use disorder. These happen to be odds ratios, but basically w uh, people in, say in the past year are two and a half times as likely to have a mood disorder uh, if they have PTSD. The lifetime risk is about uh, three times. Anxiety disorder, I wanna point out that this is actually a published number uh, in the paper, but uh, past year, uh, lifetime estimates should always be lar as large as or larger than past year estimates. So I, I would say that that's probably at least a three. But, but you get my point. A lot of other things come with PTSD. There's increased risk of suicide. We were talking about some of this as a problem uh, this morning. There's more medical illness because actually the, the behavioral changes, the, the biological changes of PTSD can put people down a path toward becoming physically ill. People have severe, can have severe functional problems at work, home, school, and overall reduced quality of life. These are real problems. It's not just the PTSD symptoms. So the implications of this 
for us is, first of all, I think we need to reduce the stigma of PTSD. Too many people fear the implications of getting a diagnosis or getting treatment, and they, they want to be tough. And you know what? This, it makes sense to me that we don't rush out and say, gee, I might have PTSD. I'm going to go get treatment because we are copers. We, we got to where we are because we've suffered a lot of adversity. We've worked through it. We've succeeded. Everybody in this room has a history of doing that. So it makes sense that, f it, it, that we would not rush out uh, to, in the same way we wouldn't rush out to get treatment for a cold because we get over colds. Now, I don't want to liken PTSD to a cold in any way. I'd rather have many colds than have PTSD. But I'm simply saying that it does make sense to me that people are trying to work things out on their own. But, but we do need to increase identification so at least people can understand their experience. In clinical settings, patients uh, typically present in primary care. And they often will present with sleep problems, just not feeling right. And it really takes a, a bit of questioning to, to unpack that. Um, I, I would say that PTSD is a hidden variable in risky health behavior. So we, we worry about teen smoking, we worry about teen drug use. It's very clear if you look at the evidence that, that you can see onset of things like substance abuse subsequent to uh, a rape or a sexual assault, for example. And. Um, Lastly, uh, we need to increase the use of effective uh, therapies because we have them and they're not yet widely available. So let me move now into uh, treatment. And may I ask on a timing where I'm at? I've got 20? 10. 10. All right. I said PTSD is not a life sentence. There are effective treatments. Uh, symptoms improve on, on, uh, not only... Um, Treatments improve not only symptoms, but also other problems, functioning, and quality of life, and the benefits are long-lasting. But many effective treatments are not uh, available. There's a lack of therapist training in the most effective treatments, and even medications, which are widely available, are not necessarily the medications that are recommended in guidelines. So I'm going to move a little quickly on these slides now uh, so that we can get to the discussion, but I'm going, to I'm going to make sure I cover the key points. First of all, psychotherapy is more effective than medication. Medications can help some people, but, but psychotherapy that goes to the heart of helping a person fix what's wrong is much more effective. If we look at the best therapies and put them against the best um, medications, and this slide happens to show the therapies that are most recommended in the PTSD practice guideline that the Department of Veterans Affairs and Department of Defense produce, uh, the, the bottom line here is that even when we put the best versus the best, we get more bang for our buck with psychotherapy. And these are the recommended uh, treatments. Now, for medications, there, there are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. These are antidepressants. So not all antidepressants are equally effective. Uh, paroxetine, sertraline, fluoxetine, and venlafaxine. In psychotherapy, the most effective therapies are what we call trauma-focused psychotherapies that help a person go back with, with their traumatic memory and work it through uh, using a variety of strategies. So you might hear about things like prolonged exposure, where you focus on repeated uh, exposure to the trauma memories so that they're no longer as uh, distressing. Cognitive processing therapy, focusing on changing beliefs about the self and the world. And eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, that's known as EMDR. And uh, in that, you, you don't talk as much, but you, you uh, use mental images uh, during uh, rapid eye movements, moving your eyes back and forth to help facilitate the processing of the material. These things really work, but I will have to say I'm sorry that if you went out now in South Royalton, if you went to Burlington, you went to White River, the majority of therapists are still not trained to deliver these treatments. And we're trying to address that uh, in our center and in uh, VA in general. Another thing to know about treatment, just quickly, is that we recommend the trauma-focused psychotherapy as the first-line treatment. So that's new. We used to recommend medications and these kind of therapies equally. But as the data have emerged, we say, try this first. If a person doesn't want these treatments or they're not available, we say, then use medications 
or a few uh, selected types of non-trauma-focused psychotherapy, meaning that other things are being worked on. One is called presence center therapy, and it works on your current current life problems that are caused by PTSD. So here's a, here's a message that if you have clients or you yourself or a family member needs treatment, there are a lot of options, and usually people can find something that's, that meets their own values and preferences. Now, this is an important slide, because I'm talking about the, the benefits of treatment. This slide comes from a study that demonstrated very long-term benefits. So in this study, it was on female sexual assault survivors. And people were randomized to one of the two top trauma-focused therapies, the cognitive processing or prolonged exposure. And the investigators followed them an average of six years later, somewhere between four and 10 years later. So very long-term recovery. This scale now does have meaning. It's called the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, CAPS. Our, our center developed it. Um, 80 is, is extremely severe, 40 is probably a threshold for PTSD, and 20 is remission. And so what you're looking at here is that before treatment, the average severity was extremely high, and after treatment, it was just above remission, or at, at long-term follow-up, just above remission thresholds. This is huge. We didn't know this because we didn't have studies that went this far out. And even more exciting is that 80% of the people were in remission. This is, this is a really important demonstration and something I try to use if people are ambivalent about getting treatment. We can make a difference. Am I at five yet? 30 seconds from five. 30 seconds from five, okay. So I know uh, that there's gonna be some talk about self-care and I think there, there's yoga today, right? Okay. So I wanted to uh, share with you where we're at in the, the evidence on treating PTSD uh, with these complementary and integrative practices. There's a lot of interest, there's a lot of use, things are widely available uh, in VA. The evidence is not there yet uh, that um, things like meditation, yoga, acupuncture, tai chi, uh, recreational therapies like fly fishing or horseback riding and such, the, the evidence is just not there. I would say the strongest evidence is for meditation. Most of the evidence is on some form of mindfulness meditation, but, but uh, the, there's not a definitive uh, signal yet. These are good things to do. These are lifelong practices that promote wellness. And so the way I like to think about it is right now, we're not at a place where I could say, gee, instead of a trauma-focused psychotherapy, why don't you start doing yoga? Rather. The way I think about it is that these are things to add to the, the path down to recovery and to maintain recovery and, and wellness. And so for, for people in the room or elsewhere uh, listening who do these practices or might want to help clients get into these practices, they are a good thing, but, but they, they are not a substitute for effective PTSD treatment at this time. We're not there with prevention. Uh, we, we, we have some signals from uh, studies that have uh, looked at people who received medications, say, in an emergency room or on a battlefield. Uh, we've done some emergency room studies with a drug called propranolol, which is for uh, hypertension. Uh, there, there's not much that we can do yet uh, to prevent uh, a person uh, to develop P from developing PTSD with medication. We do a little better with psychotherapies. Uh, if we, after a trauma, if a person has extreme symptoms, we, if we treat them with brief uh, trauma-focused therapy, that's effective. Uh, debriefing, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's very commonly used. This is psychological debriefing and not operational debriefing as it's practiced in the military, for example. And the military has been trying to build resilience, so before people are traumatized, to put them through programs. These haven't shown real benefit yet, but uh, the, the military is still pursuing uh, additional research on this. Because the idea is that you, you would help prevent uh, even the, those uh, extreme reactions before uh, the, uh, a trauma. I thought I'd try to be a little provocative with you. Um, to think about primary prevention here. Because if you've been listening to what I'm talking about, I think it's very clear that at least some of the causes of PTSD are from humans. This is something we can control. 
And so the social policy implications here are far reaching. Uh, it's one of the, PTSD is one of the few disorders that's caused by an event. So think about this. If we reduce crime, we reduce accidents, if we reduce war, even if we get people to wear seat belts, you could argue by lessening the impact of a, an auto accident that would decrease the risk of PTSD. So there's a primary prevention question here that I don't, especially because you're students, I don't want it to be lost on you that some of the job shouldn't come to helping people once they're traumatized. Some of the job really is about figuring out ways to prevent trauma from occurring in the, the first place. There's also a question about screening out individuals who seem at high risk from professions like the military and, and police and, and such. The data is not there to do that at all. And I'm, I'm not a fan, given in the current climate, I think that denies people opportunity rather than uh, really does any uh, significant prevention. So let me go now through the important facts that I've tried to uh, raise with you. Traumatic stressors are not just really bad stressors. They are distinctive, they involve life threat, and they cause distinctive symptoms. Exposure to these stressors is common. Most people have some symptoms afterward, but they don't develop PTSD. Yet PTSD is not a sign of weakness because many factors, and not just a person's personality or, or individual characteristics, determine the likelihood of developing PTSD. And also, let me leave you with this. PTSD is not a life sentence. We can treat it, we can cure it in some people. And uh, at that point, I think I have uh, evaded the timekeepers. And I will just uh, leave this uh, slide for your uh, uh, interest during the, the questions. It has some information about our website where there's a lot of resources for you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you. You know, as I was sitting here, I thought I knew something about PTSD, but apparently I don't know anything. You are really a walking encyclopedia. Uh, you know, I want to, can you give me a little background on when did uh, the medical field realize that PTSD disorder was very serious and that they needed to bring it to our attention? Could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I, I think 1980 is when it was formalized. I, it was about the mid-70s where I actually think that the women's movement, and I was in college in the early 70s, and the, the women's movement and the focus on the, uh, rape and people s uh, speaking out more about rape along with the large number of Vietnam veterans who had come back got the attention of the medical uh, community. And the, the, uh, as, as I was saying before, the fact that people started these camps, talked to one another, and figured out, hey, we're all studying the same thing. It wasn't exactly like the, the blind men and the elephant, but it was somewhat that way. And so 1980 is what was the pivotal point for understanding PTSD as a disorder that, that was unified by the experience of traumatic events and by the biological and psychological consequences of that and not by the specific events themselves. Hi. Um, very early in the conversation you said that you guys have a PTSD brain bank. I am unfamiliar with what a brain bank is. Could you explain that? Sure. Um, I, sorry, I'm used to probably talking to more uh, medical or, or mental health uh, audiences. So brain banks have been around for a while, and essentially they are tissue repositories of brains. And we use them to do analyses that we can't do in living humans that enable us to look at the, especially the genetic changes associated with, uh, with a, a given disorder or event, but also the, the, the um, structural changes. And I'll give you an example there. Probably many of you have heard about CTE, the disorder that football players uh, can get. The, the actual CTE itself actually is quite visually distinct. And so brain banks have enabled us to understand 
what's happening in the brains of people who have repeated uh, head injuries. And so we couldn't do that. We can't get that from imaging right now. We have to actually look at the tissue. And so, so in PTSD, we don't, what, we don't see anything. We have to get down into the genetics at the present time, and we're just beginning there to do that. But, but the, the technology of imaging does not allow us to know what's happening in brains. The technology of what we do with any samples that we would take from an indiv a living individual doesn't allow us to get all of the information we would get from brains. So it's a new frontier for us. Thanks. Hi, I was wondering if you could please elaborate to us how we can understand our client's story so we can best advocate for them in the courtroom or through our, our motions or, or things of that nature. I think um, that that's a, a question that deserves a, a, a fair amount of time, but I would think the most important thing is to ask the question, a to, to ask and try to uh, understand. And uh, I, I say that because oftentimes you may not think to fully ask. You may have a client who seems very disruptive uh, and angry, and they have a substance abuse problem, and not even understand, not even asking about what that's about uh, it is is very common. So I, I think that for an attorney without a mental health background, I think the other thing I would want to do is probably have the supports in place for those individuals. And I don't know what the resources are like in the state of Vermont, how easy it is to get help for people who are in the, the system. Uh, but, but I would say that for you, making yourself literate, knowing what PTSD is and isn't, having some familiarity, even the background that you got today would help. But, but I have to think first asking the question and then listening to the answer is key. And uh, Irene, are you going to talk about this yes. more later on? Okay, thank you. So earlier in the slides, you prevent, um, presented data um, based off of race and gender. Um, is there any data on sexual orientation for PTSD? Yes, a little bit. And for um, individuals who are sexual minorities, I think the biggest, there is an elevated risk of PTSD and related problems. And it, it essentially, a lot of it comes from additional exposures to traumatic events. That, that unfortunately, sexual minorities, uh, and especially transgender individuals, are, are uh, harassed, uh, assaulted uh, substantially more uh, than, uh, than um, cis individuals. And so that, um, that's something that has had increased recognition. Even in VA, we have really stepped up our game uh, in this regard now. But I like that question because it goes to the point of, it doesn't mean that people who are sexual minorities are, are weaker, there are other explanatory factors. It doesn't mean that people who are racial or ethnic minorities are weaker, there are other explanatory factors. And that's what you have to, to think. Things like gender and sexual orientation might predict everything and explain nothing. Remember that. Irene? being the subject of racism, I think the 
previous question being the subject of sexual discrimination. Can we tease out those two things, or is it we just don't have it yet? I think that this happens in such a, a, a context that it's hard to tease out. And so people who, ha I think you're talking about micro traumas, for example, or cumulative trauma, those individuals also have discrete episodic trauma. And so I, I simply would say that at the extreme, micro trauma um, is something that, if it doesn't lead to PTSD because it's not involving life threat, for example, we, we might see instead increased risk of depression, substance use, and other adversities. But individuals who have had that, this is what a point I was trying to make before, who haven't had a traumatic event but have adversities, given exposure to a traumatic event, are usually much more likely to develop PTSD. But again, think of the context. These things are not discrete. They unfold over a lifetime in a family, in a community, in a culture, and that's what makes it so hard. to. You could statistically isolate something, but that would only appeal to statisticians because it's not really the full story. Yes, a previous trauma and lifetime stressors. I mean, there can unfortunately be a negative synergy so that it, it, it more than uh, just additively increases your risk. Thank you. Am I out of time? Uh, not for the Q&A side. Oh, okay. And yes. Um, I was at the VA Monday talking to my therapist. I just started back up getting treatment. And um, one thing I mentioned to him was seeking treatment for my depression and anxiety and things like that. And I specifically said, you know, I'm not too worried about the PTSD because that's just what it is. I have to deal with it. And um, it was very, um, gave me a lot of hope to see your, your slide that there actually is a possibility for a cure. So thank you. Well, I'm really glad. First of all, thank you for speaking out. As a trauma survivor, I try to say, you know, I'm one too. I'm not just talking about statistics on, on a, a screen. Uh, it's really important when in the right context to, to speak out and let people know. It's just all of us. It's any of us. But I, I would say that my message is that there there are definitely effective treatments. It's just not all treatments. And many people, I, I just I finished a big study with over 900 veterans comparing the prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. We had Vietnam veterans in that study who'd been getting VA treatment for years who are now actually better. Now again, it's not a magic bullet. It's not uh, the kind of cures you can read about on the internet. People had to do hard work. But when you finally unlock the, the door and you find the treatment that's right for you, it really can turn your life around. And that's why we call our video gallery About Face. Because if you get the right treatment, it can make a difference. So I hope in your, thank, it's great that you're, you're back at the VA and um, it's inspiring to me and I think people in the, in the room and I hope you find the, the treatments that are right for you uh, and, and ask about them or ask me because I'd be glad to give you information. Yes, Dean, okay. Well, I really want to make sure people understand what PTSD is and isn't. I really think a priority now is to take the effective treatments that we have and make them better. We have a, 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 if I were talking in a mental health context, I, you'd hear me going on about the fact that every time we find out that not everybody got cured or remitted in a study, somebody says, oh, we have a new therapy. A popular theme right now are therapies that are implausible. You know, three sessions or a treatment that is non-traumatizing is a buzzword. And all of those things just are, are bad science and I think they cloud the issue. So taking the treatments we have and making them better and and helping people find the right treatment for them, empowering people to engage in their treatment through shared decision making is something that is a real uh, passion for me. And then the other piece, I don't have a short whistle list, Santa always had a problem with me. Uh, 
is making the treatments more available. Right now, we're still not training our mental health providers, by and large, in the most effective treatments, and they are game changers. And, and that's, that's something that I, I think we, that's on my wish list for hoping that anybody in this room or anyone you know could go out and seek PTSD treatment and not have many hurdles to finding a treatment that might actually work. We're getting there, but we have a ways to go. So I'm gonna say thank you very much and I look forward to future conversation today and beyond. Thank you again, Dr. Schnur. We're gonna take a short break. We'll be back at 10.15 with our next panel. So get some coffee, get some food, and come energized and ready to go. Thank you. <laughs>